we've been uh, doing a, a series on Jesus and my people and relationships. This week we um, we get to one that's kind of difficult. It's on communication. It's it's so large that you know it, it's kind of kind of choke on it. But I'm just going to cover a few things here. And first of all, I want you to see. You've probably seen this video if you you're on YouTube much. It's got like. 10 million hits on it or something, but it's called Nail in My Head. It's on communication. It's just, it's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? We can work it out. We can work it out. <laughs> Communication is never easy, is it? It, I mean, it is. Ne we think it should be simple, but it's never easy. Webster says communication is the exchange of information between people by means of speaking, writing, using a common system of signs or behavior. Sounds easy enough, right? The dimension really is more like this. A process by which information is confused by individuals through a conflicting web of emotions, preconceptions, backgrounds and misunderstandings. Now that really is communication as we know it. Never easy. What do you think when someone says, hey, um, we need to talk? Ooh, yeah, I know. How can I get away from this? You know, how can I get out of here? You know, how can I run away? We, we begin to think of those ways and why now? What have I done? What have I not done? What did I say? What didn't I say? What has he heard? What has she heard about me? And it's never easy. And then to make things much look worse today, you, you know, we throw in social media where sometimes we post things late at night that we probably shouldn't be posting and, and texting and emails and, you know, facial expressions and innuendos cannot be communicated through that. And, you know, Raise your hand if you've ever really messed that up, right? You know, you, you text something, email something, and go, gee, if I could get that back. You know, there needs to be some app to pull the email out of their box, right, and get it back. And we call communication a skill, but really communication is more of an art because it's not black and white. It's an area of gray, shady areas where we... We think we're doing okay, and then someone says, we need to talk. Or a friend says, yeah, I heard you guys aren't getting along right now. We go, oh, my, what have they heard? What, what's going on? What did I say? What did I not say? For someone to know that we love them, we must be able to communicate our love for them. And for someone to know that we have a conflict with them, we have to be able to communicate that conflict as well. And all of our relationships are influenced by our communication. It's an extremely important topic in relationships. And with that, I want to just read a few passages from James. You've heard this before, James 3, 2 to 8. 
for we all stumble in many ways. Yeah, he's, he's real. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. And then he says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Obviously, James has the same problem that we did, that we have, you know, problems with communication. We, we say the wrong things, or what we say is taken the wrong way, so we think. And, and the forest, he says, is set on fire, or the ship is taken off course. And so we look to Jesus as the master communicator to say, Jesus, show us how to talk to each other. Show us how to communicate uh, with each other. And we, we learn some things from him. We're just going to touch on briefly here about honesty and trust and a little bit of dealing with conflict. First, we learn from Jesus that our communication is all about trust. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus has a very short instruction about establishing trust with people. Matthew 5 beginning with verse 34. He says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Just let it be yes or no, he says. When you say yes, then mean yes. And when you say no, then you mean no. When you, We don't need to swear by anything because people will trust what we say if we're trustworthy. Now, sit, think about that for a minute. See, the whole foundation of relationship is trust. When you say yes, this is the way it is, the person believes you. And when you say that it's no then that's what it is. The person believes you. There's a funny old story about uh, an old man was casually walking uh, around on a country lane with his mule and his dog. All old men go walking with mules and dogs and funny stories. But suddenly a speeding pickup truck came around the corner and hit the man and his dog and his mule. So the old man decides, so what he's going to do is he's going to get some damages for this. So he sues the guy, and goes to court, and the old man's on the stand, and the counsel for the defense is cross-examining him, and he asks a simple question. He says, I want you to answer yes or no to the following question. Did you or did you not say at the time of the accident that you were perfectly fine? The old man says, well, my mule and my dog and I, we were walking along the road. He says, wait just a minute. He says, says, stop, stop. I ask you to tell me yes or no. Did you say at the time of the accident that things were, that you were perfectly fine? The old man starts again. He says, well, me and my dog and my mule, we were walking along the road. And the defense attorney says, your honor, Please instruct him to answer yes or no to my question. We don't need to know anything else. Would you please tell him to answer the question, yes or no? And the judge says, well, he obviously has something else to say here, and I think we need to hear what he's got to say. So proceed, sir, with your story. So the man says, well, me and my dog and my mule, we were walking along the road, and a truck came around the corner too fast and knocked us down to the ditch, and the driver got out of the truck and saw my dog who was there on the ground and badly hit and went back to the truck, his pickup truck, and got the rifle and shot the dog. And 
Then he came and he saw the mule was, had a broken leg and did the same thing. The mule shot him in the head. And then he said, what about you? And I said, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> yes or no? Yes or no it should always work. Yet let your yes be yes and your no, no. When we were kids, uh, we learned to lie and then to swear that we were not lying. It's a survival skill probably for young children, you know. So you'd tell a story and, and one of your friends would say, that didn't really happen. You'd go, oh, yes, it did. You'd say, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. That's what we used to say back in the 50s and the 60s. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. So who would you rather have as a friend? A person with a needle in his eye? Okay. Our guy you trusted. Trust is the foundation of relationships. And kids aren't really very good liars. You know, they're really just not that good at it. It's, it's a learned art that, that we adults teach them how to do. They learn that. We, we, you know, they learn it from adults. We, we promise kids, uh, and they learn that our yes really is probably a maybe. And we say uh, our no's the same way. We say, don't do that, or I'm going to. And then they do it, and we go, okay, okay. The next time that you do that, then you're going to get it. You know, so, um, and they say, yeah, 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 after a while, I bet, you know, you've told me that so many times and you never do it. And then we, you know, one lie, one little half truth creates this crack in the foundation of a relationship that threatens to bring it down. Relationship experts say that when we speak, there are at least six messages that can be produced. Number one, you mean what you say. Two, what you actually said. Three, what the other person hears, four, what the other person thinks he, he or she hears, five, the other person says about what the other person says about what you said, and then six, what you think the other person said about what you said. Those are all the possibilities. And then we mix in a few half-truths and a few lies, and we wonder why we're misunderstood, a few exaggerations. It's because people don't trust what we say. Our yes is not yes. And our no is not no. And, and Christians, this, this is the bad news here, is that Christians do the same thing. We play the same kind of games. How many stories I've heard from people, um, uh, for instance, not that long ago, we were renovating a house, and I had to talk the contractor into working for me because I was a pastor. He said, I usually don't work for pastors because they've all cheated me. I go, what? He goes, oh, yeah. He says, they get out of contracts because they go, well, God is just telling me not to do that now. All right. So their yes really isn't yes, and their no is a no. When we got done with it, he said, okay, I'll work for you again. He said, because you were honest with me. But Christians are not immune from this. What if trust has been broken? To rebuild trust, it takes truth and time, but it can be done. It's about our yes being yes and our no being no. Not yes, but, or no, but. And yes, I love you. No, I wasn't listening. Yes, I'm going to keep my promise. No, I can't accept what you're doing. Yes, I'll go through this with you. No, yelling at me is not going to change my mind. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. It builds trust and relationships flourish. Secondly, there's a connection that we learn from Jesus between our mouth and our heart. Um, what comes out of my mouth, he says, is what is buried in my heart. And what comes out of my mouth also influences my heart. There's a connection between what we say and what we hold to be most important. And this has a lot to do with our relationships. Have you ever lost your temper and really told somebody what you thought? course you have. Have you done it this week? Maybe. You know, we lose our temper. It, it comes out and kind of shocking some of the things we might say sometimes if it's been, you know, building up for a while. And when, when we get angry, we can hear ourselves saying things that we later regret. And we say, oh, I've got to watch what, my, what I say. I've got to watch my tongue, you know. Remember, remember that we began with James and there in the eighth verse, he's eighth 
verse, he said, but no human being can tame the tongue. You just can't watch it that much. There's no amount of protection that you can put over your tongue that will stop you saying what's really in your heart. The point is that we, we have to watch what we say. The, excuse me. The point is not that we have to watch what we say so we would, won't hurt people and destroy a relationship, but that the words reveal what are, what's hidden in us. And that's what Jesus taught. He had a great conflict with the Pharisees because they had opposite views of how a person was made acceptable to God. The Pharisees said that you you do all this ritualistic cleansing, that you watch what you eat, that you act real religious, and then that that will make you acceptable to God. And, and Jesus, you know, he said, well, how's that working for you? You don't look real clean to me. You know, it's not working too well. And I don't think that you're, you're any cleaner than anyone else. And so he said a couple things about the mouth and the heart that, that, that tell us something. Matthew 12, 34. He says, you brood of vipers. Here he's talking to the Pharisees. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's, what's in our core, our core beliefs. Later on, another occasion, he made the same point, Matthew 15, 18 to 19. He says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. See, our, our mouth reveals what's hidden in us. He says, it's, it's not your words that you need to watch over. It's your heart. It's your core. It's the things that you really value and believe in. So, so what do you value and worship? That's what he's saying. That's where these hurtful things are coming from. So when we get surprised from some things that, that come out of our mouths uh, that hurt relationships, we learn from Jesus that it's not about controlling our words or watching our words, that those, what comes out of our mouth, maybe alarms, may, may be kind of a litmus test as to where the core of our life is. And we remember that Jesus came preaching and he said, remember, he says the, the time is now, the, the kingdom of God is here, repent and believe the gospel. That's what he said. He said the kingdom of God is right now. That's always our call, to have our hearts changed, to have hearts that are directed towards God. We are to live in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is where Jesus is recognized as kings, as a king. Dallas Willard said something in a, in a book that, that really struck me um, that I read a couple months ago. He said that with most of our relationships, what's going on is our kingdom is trying to do battle with someone else's kingdom. He says, but if you're in the kingdom of God, if Jesus is your king, okay, then his kingdom always wins. If that's where your life is lived. So when our kingdom is threatened and we get worried and we get defensive and things come out of our mouths that reveals, that reveals who's on our throne. And Jesus says, it's not the words. That's not the problem. It's where your life is. It's the matter of who is the king, what's in your heart, where's your heart. The mouth and the heart are connected. And when it comes to communication, to have a whole, honest, truthful relationship, Christ has to be king. So the communication lessons from Jesus are first, be truthful, for trust is the foundation. Secondly, learn that it isn't about controlling your words. It's about having Jesus as king, having your hearts that are his. And if we pay attention, there's a, a few things that we learn from Jesus, just briefly here, on how to handle conflict, because we all have conflict. What we see is that when Jesus was criticized, he gave clear responses. He, he didn't get defensive. He never got personal. But he responded to the attack with just a clear, confident response. For instance, there's a time in, in John 8 where the Pharisees are challenging him because Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And the Pharisees said, well, that's what you say. You say you're the light of the world. What? Who else is saying that? 
Where's your witness? Who else is saying that you are the truth and the light of that world? So Jesus replied, he said, well, my father bears witness that I am the light of the world. And so this is what, what happens next, John 8, 19. So the Pharisees, they said to him, therefore, where's your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Now that sounds simple enough. We, we hear that and we think, well, they know it's father in heaven. They're asking, where's your father in heaven? But that's not what they're saying at all. We, we think father in heaven. That's not what they're accusing him of. You see, what they're saying is, where's your father? You don't know who's your, who your father is. In today's vernacular, we'd say, where's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And that's what they're saying to Jesus. Because they're accusing him of being illegitimate. And that, that always followed him around. You know, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And they were constantly accusing him of not being righteous enough, of not being of a good family. Low blow. I mean, here they are doing theological battle, and they essentially call him a name. But Jesus doesn't call them a name back. He doesn't say, I, I know you are, but who am I, right? Instead, what he does is he just states this, this truth. He doesn't get mad. He states a fact. They don't know him because they don't know his father. And Jesus shows us how to respond when we are attacked. We shouldn't attack back. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good to get personal. When we attack back, we just confirm to the person who attacked us that he or she may be right because they're really getting to us when we get mad. We make the attack legitimate. Solomon in Proverbs 9, uh, 7 to 8, I, I did this in the message because it just reads uh, so much more understandable today. He said, if you reason with an arrogant cynic, you'll get slapped in the face. Confront bad behavior, and you'll get a kick in the shins. So don't waste your time on a scoffer. All you ever get for your pains is abuse. But if you correct those who care about life, that's different. They'll love you for it. Since it's Mother's Day, I'll tell a short story on my mom. I've told this before but uh, it's worth telling again. When I was probably 25, 26 years old and farming, my mother was um, the owner of the farm ground that I was farming. And we had a next door neighbor who was not real easy to get along with. And you know, they always say that fences make good neighbors. Well, we took the fence down between us and this neighbor and we immediately began to have uh, boundary disputes. Just so happened the neighbor was a lawyer and so we got a notice for us to come into the lawyer's office because we had been farming some of his grounds so to speak he thought or charged and so there we sat in the lawyer's office and he didn't handle it himself he had one of his associates another partner in the firm handle it but I remember being 25 years old and just furious and scared and you know, you sit there around this table and they're using jargon that you don't know anything about. So I was getting mad. And my mom just killed them with sweetness. Well, how's your daughter doing this year? Oh, she was so good in school, such a beautiful girl. And this guy, the lawyer, was being really snarky, you know, just, just really nasty and mean. And my mom just diffused the whole thing. She never let, let it get personal. They were getting personal because they said, well, your father did the same thing to us. He used to get over the line, too, when my dad was dead. You know, it didn't have anything to do with my dad. And I was ready to, you know, get really mad. My mom didn't do it. When, when, when she was accused of something, instead of accusing back, what she did was she just gave him some Jesus treatment. She didn't get personal with him. Jesus never got personal. He never got defensive. He used light. He used truth to expose the air of the attack. And the last thing I want to point out is that when he was rejected, Jesus moved on. You know, perhaps the most difficult and important lesson to learn from Jesus is what to do 
when what you say and who you are is rejected. Even Jesus, the perfect Son of God, was rejected. He was disrespected. So we see that rejection is not always something about us. It's not always about something that we've done wrong. We may be rejected because we are standing for the right. That's possible. So what do you, you do when you've tried everything with someone and you've tried to give them grace and you've tried to give them love and you're still being rejected? They're still not receiving it. You're trying to be nice to them and they're just not going to accept it. I think we often do the opposite of what Jesus did. We just keep chasing harder and harder after them. We double down on our efforts. You know, I'm going to make them be nice to me. I'm going to love them so much that they don't have a choice whether to do this or not. But it actually has kind of the opposite effect after a while, oftentimes. They think that since we are pursuing them, that, this, that they are more important. But that's not what Jesus did. When he's, he was rejected, he just moved on. Probably the best known example is the rich young ruler. The young guy that comes to Jesus and what must, must I do to inherit eternal life? And, you know, Jesus says, what do you say? And he tells him, he says, oh, you only lack one thing. Go sell all that you have. Give your money to the poor and come follow me. And says that he walked away. We want to go, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. Jesus, you need to get him back. So well, how about selling half of what you got? You know, can we negotiate with you here, rich young ruler? Because the man rejected what Jesus said, but Jesus didn't run after him. He just let him go. When a, a town would reject the, the message of Jesus, it says that he would just move on. It, it's so important that he told his disciples, he said, if, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, just shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town and move on. In other words, you can't always push your way in where the door is not open. Move on. Let God do the work. So I'm going to end there. there. There we are with just a few relationship things from Jesus. Number one, trust is the foundation of all relationships. Let your yes be yes, your no, no. Number two, what comes out of our mouth tells us what's hidden in our heart. It's not a problem with our mouth. It's a problem with whose kingdom that we're living in. And number three, conflict's going to come. But if we do what Jesus did and not get personal about it, we will just move on when the door's not open. Let's, let's close with a prayer. As deep cries out